Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. Man, I am so happy we're on the dispensation of grace. I am so, oh man, thank God. We're living in a time of grace. And I just want to remind you what grace is. It's the love and kindness that God shows in his complete willingness to give people favors he does not owe them and blessings they don't deserve. I'm going to read that again. We're in a time where God is making a decision or has made a decision to express his love and kindness and show his complete, complete willingness to give people favors we don't deserve and he does not owe us his complete willingness to do that. Amen. Amen. And let us start in the book of Romans, Romans chapter five and verse 21, Romans chapter five and verse 21. Romans chapter five and verse 21. I'm going to start at verse 20, however. It says, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. It says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you see that? He said that grace will reign through righteousness. We talk about reigning in life. Well, this is how it happens. He said we reign. We reign through grace or we reign in grace through righteousness. It's because of our right standing that we can reign in grace. It's because we've been put in right standing with God. We've been brought into harmony with him. It's because the, that there is nothing between us and God. He says because of this, we can reign. Through grace, through grace, it puts us on the top. Through grace, we can have victory in every area of our lives. Through grace, we can have peace and joy. We can abound and we can, uh, uh, we can have stability, health and healing. That's how we reign. We don't reign through our own ability, but we reign through righteousness. And I just want to say that um, when we first started talking about righteousness, which was before we started even talking about grace, uh, God impressed upon me how important that I understood righteousness, that it was nothing that I earned, but it was something that was uh, delivered and given to me, that I came in right standing with him because of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you remember the teachings on that when we were being taught that even when you do something you shouldn't do, even when you sin, the farthest back you can fall was back into righteousness. That, that, that was, you, couldn't, you couldn't fall from, it couldn't be taken away from you. Once you gain right standing with God, let's look at uh, Romans chapter five, Romans chapter five, starting at verse one. And it reads in King James, it says, um, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He says that because of Jesus Christ, we have access. We have access to this grace because of Jesus Christ. Again, we're just talking to you about the fact that uh, we don't have to work at this and we don't have to strive at this. But it is a work of faith. It's what we believe, what we trust in, what we believe that Jesus Christ actually did for us. And, you know, we have to keep saying it and saying it and saying it. And the reason being is because I don't know about you. I was trenched in law. I mean, I was I mean, I was deep in uh, working my faith as, uh, or either uh, having faith in my faith. It wasn't so much, you know, I had faith in God. It was. I got to do something to cause God to move on my behalf. And when you are taught like that for many, many years, uh, you hear the message of concerning grace and that Jesus has already done it all. And you can receive that mentally. 
But when some challenges come along, sometimes you kind of try to step back over there and say, let me, and then you're, so it's a, it's a, it's a true renewing of the mind. Let me put it that way. It's a, it's a, it's a transforming, it's a change, it's a new thing. And unfortunately, sometimes people go all the way to the left. Well, you know, I work so hard now, I'm not going to do nothing. Someone asked me after we taught maybe, I don't know, two or three years concerning grace, um, they asked me, they said, well, then, Pastor Deborah, we, we, we don't have to pray or nothing since, you know, grace is done at all. You, we, we just, you know, it, isn't that right? We don't have to just do anything? I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> We're resting in the finished works of Jesus, but how the word goes about it. He said, you still need to ask. Amen. You still need to ask God, yeah. you know. <laughs> God's not just going to throw stuff on you, and the devil's certainly not going to let you just waltz into it. So we don't want, we don't, we want to, we, we need to have a balance concerning grace and concerning what our responsibilities are. The way I look at it is there, there must be a response to grace. There's a response to grace. When you, when you hear about the goodness of God, when you hear the fact that Jesus has, has, has quote unquote done it all, when you hear the fact that uh, we don't have to try to make God do anything, there, there needs to be a response to that. How are you going to respond to the graciousness of God? Right. It's just like when someone else does, does you a favor. I mean, if nothing else, you would say thank you. I appreciate it. You didn't have to do this. Isn't that all the things that you say to people? Oh, you didn't have to do this. Oh, thank you so much. And you have all these kind of warm, fuzzy feelings concerning somebody who's done something for you that maybe you couldn't do for yourself. Couldn't possibly do for yourself. There is a response that comes. And that's what God is telling us when you hear about the grace of God, there should be a response concerning that. God is waiting to see, you know, what do you think about the, this, this goodness? What do you think about this, my graciousness? What do you think about my favor that I'm offering you? And then for him to say, you can continuously come to me. I'm not going to hold anything against you. He's pretty much saying, just go ahead and relax in me. Just go ahead and relax in me. But he says here, let me read it again. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith. Look at that. We have access by faith. We have access to God's grace by faith. It's what you believe. It's what you think. <laughs> He says, we have access by faith into this grace and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 2. I'm not going to keep you very long. Sometimes I just believe a little bit is enough <laughs> to give you, to, to cause you to uh, think, to cause you to sit and meditate, to think about the goodness of God. You know, sometimes we need to just sit back and think about the goodness of God how good God really is and the fact of how good he, he, God longs. He longs to express himself as God in our lives. That's what he wants. That's what his, that's what his desire is. And then again, as I said before, we have an enemy on the opposing side trying to get us to believe that he's really not going to do it. He's not going to really, because it's too good. It's just, it's just, it, could, it couldn't be that easy. But God wants us to know it really, it really is that easy. And we need to, to um, keep our, 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 our sense of uh, urgency. We need to keep our sense of, uh, oh gosh, uh, belief concerning what God has said. In other words, God doesn't want us to be passive. I, I, I think that's the best way to say it. God does not want us to be passive, but he wants us to be aggressive about the things that he is saying belong to us. Because again, the Bible says that Jesus came to give us life 
He said, I came to give it to you more abundantly, fill to the full till it overflows. But prior to that, he says that the enemy came. He said he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he is on his job. I mean, you can, you can be having the best day in the world. It can just seem like it is so awesome. But Satan will send something to you to disrupt that day. And so you have to, you, <laughs> it can't be case Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. It's got to be, I know, I know what God has said concerning me. I know, and sometimes even in church, I, I love the, Oh, yay, yay, yay. This is great. Oh, this is so good. Oh, my, this is great. But how many of you, once you left the pep rally, and, and I'm, I'm saying that genderly, once you've left the pep rally and you walk outside, and some people, not even, before, not even when they, by the time they get outside, inside, Satan comes with a thought. That's why the Bible says that we have to cast down imaginations. You know, because he, he's, he's all in, he's trying to be all in your thought life, just, you know, just showing you things, saying things to you. And we have to be on guard concerning those things. We got to understand that we're in here and we're among, you know, all of our fellow believers and everybody's like grace, grace, grace. And then when you leave here, there's some things you need to actually shout grace to. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? You you it's, it's like, OK, all right now. And people talk about uh, warfare, spiritual warfare. Just reminders, spiritual warfare takes place in your mind. It is, it's, the, it's the thoughts that sometimes bombard your mind trying to get you to disbelieve the thing that God has said. And you have to stand strong and stand firm in what you believe. It can't be. You know, you, you, can't, you can't run back here or, or call up Pastor Lamar and say, hey, <laughs> I need that pep rally again. You know, I need, let me get my pom-poms. And, and you know, you, you, you're going to have to start pulling out the word and saying, this is what the word of God said. This, you're going to have to be like Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew he was the son of God. Yet Satan showed up, didn't he? If you be. And then what did Jesus have to do? He has to say, it is written. And we have to start saying it is written because, uh, again, we can read about all the awesomeness of God. And, and, it, and it really, really is awesome how God has set this up. When I think about it, I'm like, there is no human being who could have ever set this up like God. Nobody, no, they, there is no way in this world anybody who could have come up with a plan that God came up with. Nobody could have come up with this plan because Satan thought, man, I got you now, God. I got you now. And that's because he knows that God is a righteous God, but God is also a God of judgment. He know God is a gracious God and a good God, but God is also a God of judgment. And Satan knows and he, he, he knew that. So it's like, okay. I have got to figure out a way to get God to make a mistake, to get God to go against himself. That's why it was like, what is man that you are so mindful of him? I, I, I see man's heart. They, they, they wicked. I see man's heart. I see man. But your goodness, God is a God of goodness. Your goodness, God going to trip you up. Your goodness is going to trip you up. Uh-huh. I'm going to get you back through your prized possession. Because you got to judge them, God. You got to judge them. Because they're sinners. Remember, 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 the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, God. But you're trying to be kind to this man. And we all know they keep sinning. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he picked the wrong one to kill. He killed an innocent man. Killed an innocent man who had the ability to die for all of our sins, transgressions. He did it all. 
He took care of it all. He said, I've paid the price so that so that sin cannot be imputed to them. I've already taken care of that. It's already been handled. So unjustly, Satan killed Jesus. And that's why Jesus was able to get up from the grave. Taking care, taking, having taken care and paid for everything that we would have had to pay for. Therefore, it was like God could be good to us because of Jesus. God can be good to us because of Jesus. That's why we don't, that's why we don't depend and weigh God's goodness upon our behavior. Amen. There is no, we don't have to do that. We don't have to, because it wasn't our behavior that made us righteous. It was Jesus' behavior that made us righteous. It was what Jesus did that made us righteous with God, gave us right standing with God. So therefore, we don't actually have to perform. Are y'all following me? We don't have to perform at all. We don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to play any games. We don't have to do any mind tricks. We just keep it basic. I always say just, you know, when, when you're challenged, say Jesus already paid for it. I don't, I don't have to pay for that anymore. I, Jesus already paid for my peace. Jesus already paid for my healing. Jesus already paid for my prosperity. Jesus is already taking care of all of that. So I'm telling you, saying you don't have a right. You don't have a right. Glory to God. Well, let's go to Colossians, Colossians chapter one. And I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible. I'm actually going to read Colossians chapter one, starting at verse 27 through Colossians chapter two, verse three. And I'm going to read this to you out of the Message Bible. Because um, understanding this, in God's plan, of course, the Jewish people thought that the Messiah was just for them. But in God's plan, his plan was to uh, offer salvation to the entire world. Amen. Amen. So here in uh, Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 27, it says, God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing. The mystery in a nutshell is just this, Christ in you. And I believe the King James said, the hope of glory. The mystery. So all these other mysteries that people have uh, kind of held over our heads for many years, you know, how people read stuff and they tell you you can't understand the Bible and, and you know, God is mysterious and, you know, he working all these ways that you cannot figure it out and, and you know, the, the, there are hidden secrets in the word of God and, 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 and you as lay people, you cannot understand God, only us, the ecclesiastical, you know, the ones with the colors and, and, and you don't know enough depth to understand who God is and you don't know the Greek and you don't know the Hebrew and you don't know the Latin and you don't know the Arabic. Wouldn't it be horrible if we all had to learn and be, that word ain't even bilingual, what is it when you have to learn? Multi, what is it? Multilingual. Multilingual in order for us to understand God. Wouldn't that be a horrible thing? Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not downgrading that on account of when you, when you know some things in the Greek and the Hebrew, it helps, it, it helps you to understand. But I look at that and say, okay, Pastor Lamar, you figure out what the Greek and the Hebrew is. When I come to get equipped, just tell me what the word means, okay? So I'll understand it. You understand you, are you all understanding what I'm saying? Okay, because that's what pastors and teachers do. They come to equip you. Amen. Amen. So. He says here, <laughs> the mystery in a nutshell is just this. I'm glad he kept it simple. He said, is Christ in you? You have to understand that Christ moved in on the inside of you. You got to understand you're in Christ and Christ is in you. And wherever, whatever Jesus is experiencing, that's what you're supposed to be experiencing too because you're in him. Yeah, <laughs> the Bible tells us we're seated in heavenly places with him. He tells us, have the mind of Christ. He says, so whatever Jesus has, we got it too. Yes, 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 yes. 
If Jesus is at peace, we need to be at peace too. If Jesus is not sick, then we don't need to accept sickness or disease. Glory to God. Let me, I, let me go over here a little bit. We don't have to accept sickness or disease. And we don't. And as I was thinking and pondering, you know, the scriptures, and I thought, okay, concerning Pastor Poe's death, I know people probably have wondered concerning him and what happened. And Pastor Dahl and I talked about it briefly, but I knew I know what my husband's stance was. And he, he shared it with us. He said, um, if I'm there and I'm faced with death, he said, I don't want anybody to resuscitate me. He said, I don't want anybody. And he made that so clear. And I actually, I actually forgot that he had a do not resuscitate me clause in his will. And so uh, he chose. I know he chose. I know he chose because when I, when I arrived home, my husband was very warm. And I started to resuscitate him. And then I stopped. And I asked God, I said, uh, I, asked, I actually asked Greg, I said, what are you doing? Because there was no stress. There was no, it was peaceful like I'm asleep, rest. And I said, what are you doing? And then I stopped and I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he said, it's over. And I immediately got up and looked to the future. And then when the paramedics came in, they said, oh, he's still warm. And they started to try to do, resuscitate him, but he was not cooperating. He chose. And I, I thought I might need to clear that up because I know people have said, Pastor Bo was a man of faith. Surely, you know, he had enough faith to believe God, but he wasn't believing God to live any longer. He really wasn't. And so he didn't. And it was a choice. But I've known for years that saints choose. Because I, 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 ask, I, I ask God questions that I want answers for. And for those who are close to me, whenever they had a loved one to go home to be with the Lord, the first thing I'd ask them was, what was the last conversation you had with them? What did they say? What did they sound like? And they were choosing. Because God heals people, because you know, you hear people, oh, they had stage four cancer. They had, but God heals people of stage four cancer. God, I mean, and normally when I'm talking to someone and they call me about, okay, I have a loved one and, you know, they're in the hospital, my first question is, what do they want? Amen. Because you cannot pray against what they do not want. I don't care how powerful you are, how faithful you are, you can have the gift of healing, but if they choose to go home to be with the Lord, that is their choice. And there is, and some people even try to hang on for loved ones. That happened with my father because of my youngest brother. He just kept saying, Dad, Dad, do you, you want to live or you want to die? Well, what, what, what do you say to a person? Because of him, he kept saying, I want to live. And he just kept living and living. And then when he'd get close to death, they'd call us. And then Gerald would go in and talk to him. And they're like, oh, OK, he's good again. I mean, it was almost like a yo-yo. It was like, uh, OK, back and forth and back and forth. And so um, <laughs> my sister called me. She said, she said, Deborah, she said, I, she said, I believe dad is hanging on for Gerald. And I said, I, I know, because he wants him to be at peace. He wants him to be 
all right. And so I, I had a conversation with him. I said, have you talked to dad for real? Talk to him about what he wants. And he was like, well, you know, I'm asking him and I'm telling him and I'm playing all these Ron Canole songs and I'm doing this, doing this. I was like, mm -hmm, you are, you are doing that. I said, but have you considered what he desires and what he wants and where he is? And, uh, and then he started, of course, telling me all these things that my father was saying. And I'm like, okay, you have got to let him go. My father wasn't suffering in any kind of way. And that was one of the things they kept trying to get us. Yeah, I'm going to put him in hospice. Of course, we were leaving that decision to my brother because he was his caregiver. And he kept saying, no, no, I want to put him in hospice. And then we, family, you know, some of you know, you have this family thing trying to decide what you want to do, if you're going to do life support, if you're going to let him go, and all these things. And so we're sitting there, and the doctors are saying, well, you know, we just want him to be very comfortable and not in any pain. So I stopped. I said, is my father in any pain? He goes, well, no, 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 he's not in any pain. Okay, uh, so why do you keep saying <laughs> you, you want to? <laughs> and they were, okay, well, so what we need to do is we need to do a trach so he can breathe better. And I'm like, we're like, okay, just do that. They go in to do the trach. Now he's breathing just fine. I'm telling you, he, I know they didn't know what to do with him because he was up and down and up and down and up and down. And all of it had to do with com whatever conversation he was having with my brother. That's good. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty good family in the fact that we don't, we're not argumentative about what, you know, uh, about anything, actually. So we just kept waiting for my brother, waiting for my brother, waiting for my brother. And then finally he called me. He says, Deborah, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and sign the papers and put Dad in hospice. I said, okay. And... Um, I don't know what conversation they had after that, but they were supposed to put him in hospice on Monday, and Gerald decided, I think, on that Saturday, Friday, I get the dates mixed up, I think Friday, and he's supposed to wait for the weekend. Well, when he decided to sign the papers to put him in hospice, my father died. And Gerald called me, and he said, just don't think Dad wanted to go to hospice. I, just, I said, I just don't think he did either. When you mentioned he was putting him in hospice, he went, hey, you know what, I'm out of here now. This is getting to be too much. <laughs> Too much. So I thought I, I thought I might share that with you all so that you'd understand that Pastor Poe made a choice. When I talked to Dr. Dollar, he said, oh, the decisions that we make. And I said, yeah, it was it was a choice. I'm not I'm not I'm 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 out of here. And uh, of course, again, with conversations that we had prior to that, he told me two weeks prior to that. He says, there's one other thing I need to do. I didn't think one meant last one, but he said he told me, he says, there's one other thing I need to check on. And we talked about it. I said, well, this is where you get your answer from. He called me. I mean, he was so excited. Okay, it's done, Deborah. It's good, it's good, it's good. And then he became very passive after that. For that next two weeks, very passive. It's just like, Greg, what are you gonna do today? I don't know. How many of you know that never comes out of Pastor Poe's mouth? I don't know. I was like, you don't know. I said, you're going to play golf? Eh, maybe. Okay. Um, you're going to go have lunch with the guys? Eh, I don't know. You're going into the office? And it was for two weeks. I don't know. Uh, hadn't decided. I'll uh, let you know later. Just thinking. And even the day of his death, I said, what, what are you going to do today? Oh, I don't know. I was <laughs> like... Whoa, okay, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And he called me around about one o'clock and um, he asked me to do something for him concerning an, uh, one of our attorneys. And I said, Well, you know, Greg, I already got the answer to that. He said this. He said, Well, check with him again. And I said, Okay, I'll do that and I'll, I'll bring you the answer when I get home. He said, Okay. And then he said, Deborah, remember this timing is everything. And I said, Okay. He said, timing is everything. I said, okay. And we hung up. And that was the last time I talked to him. He told me timing is everything. And anybody who knows him, he, he knows timing is everything. 
So when, when I, I, I felt like I needed to share that because I know some people, are, they, they wonder, well, what happened? He chose. And in his mind, I had com- I've completed everything I believe that God wanted me to do. And do any of you all recall in his talking about transition? And what did he say? He said, uh, what if, what if everything I've done, I've done it to this point so that my children can take it further? And Pastor Poe didn't say anything without reason, ever. So his expectation was for us to carry on. Understanding timing is everything. Understanding, finish your race, I finished mine. And I've given you everything I think you need to go on. So just walk it out. I hope that helps some people. Because I, 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 I know people are like, well, how are you, how are you doing what you do? Because I knew my husband. Because I knew my husband. And because of the grace of God and because of the things that God keeps sharing with me about future, 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 future. And you got your own race to run and you got your own thing that you're supposed to do that I called you for a purpose and for a plan. I did this for you. Now, you know, it's, it's us, me and God, and what God wants and desires for me to do. It's the same way with you guys. It's what God desires for you to do. And what we're doing is, to the best of our ability, we're trying to equip you to carry it out in grace. Amen? So let me start again, uh, Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 27. It says, God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside and out. Regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing, the mystery in a nutshell is just this. Christ is in you. Therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of our message. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic. Christ, no more, no less. That's what I'm working so hard at day after day, year after year, doing my best with, in, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me. I want you to realize that I continue to work as hard as I know how for you and also for the Christians over at La- Laodicea. Not many of you have met me face to face, but that doesn't make any difference. Know that I'm on your side, right alongside you. You're not in this alone. I want you woven into a tapestry of love in touch with everything there is to know of God. Then you will have minds confident at rest focused on Christ, God's great mystery. So the mystery is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, living on the inside of us, breathing on the inside of us, instructing us by his spirit, his spirit, talking to our spirit, sharing with us the things of God, understanding that It's God's kind intent. It's what he's wanted all along is to be personal with all of us to talk to us, to help us understand that I understand everything. That's why I sent Jesus so he can experience the things that you experience. So I'm able to run to your rescue. I'm here with you. I'm talking to you spirit to spirit. Every day I want to express myself to you. Every day I want you to to see me in my glory. Every day, I want to see you in the glory that I placed upon you. Understand who you are and what your position is. Understand I've given you my spirit so that you can be strengthened in the inner man. Understand that the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is not just for speaking in tongues, but the Bible declares that we are speaking mysteries. We are speaking mysteries, meaning those things that we don't even know anything about. We can address those things through the spirit of God concerning ourselves and concerning other people. God is wanting us to totally rely on him, lean on him, trust in him. And he says, when you feel weary, that's why I gave you the Holy Spirit. Who is your comforter? Your comforter is not other people. Your comforter is the Holy Spirit. God wants some supernatural things happening in our lives. That's why he says, you know, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. 
That's why he says, I, I, he said, receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of speaking in tongues. So when you're challenged and when you're in trouble, understand that I have given you a helper to help you. When you don't understand the scriptures, I've given you help. There is no reason for us to feel helpless in any situation. Although, again, challenges come and you may initially feel helpless. But understand, the, the great mystery is, is that Christ is in you. you got to remember, he is in me. Yeah. Yeah. The supernatural abilities of God reside on the inside of me. And I can do whatever I need to do. I can, I can win. I can overcome. If I'm, if I'm thinking wrong, the Holy Spirit can give me another thought. So I run to, I run to the Holy Spirit who is my help so that my thoughts will line up with the thoughts of heaven so that I can see the things manifest that he keeps talking about. So again, it's not just a pep rally, but it's a victory cry. It's a victory walk. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. And I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, it is it's so outstanding what God desires to do on the inside of us and what he desires, how he wants us to impact other men's lives and other people's lives. I'm telling you, just by what you know now, you can impact, you can impact many. Just by what you know now. Amen. God is not a selfish God, and he doesn't want us to be selfish. But he wants us to distribute. Amen. Amen. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word GIVERTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.